So I'm going to do something a little bit different today. I'm going to work on a little project. Now I saw Dustin Watts. He's got his free touch deck project he designed. A fairly complex project as far as what's gone into making it. But the actual project to build it looks pretty simple. I'm going to actually try and build one. Now I actually have basically all the stuff I need to do this. I don't actually have to buy any bits or get any boards made. Because I actually happen to have a board which I designed to work with an ESP32. And a 3.5 inch touch screen. I already got one. Right, This is one of my own project. So... I can use this board to make the touch deck. Dustin Watts got a really good tutorial on it. It's got some videos on it. He goes through really thoroughly about how to make one of these things. He's even got his own version. I think you can buy one he makes. But he goes through a lot of detail. He gives you links in the Gerbers, I think, to get the boards. Stuff like that. He gives you everything you need to know. So, good work. I've already got the stuff on hand because I've used these same things for my own projects. And as I said, this is the board which I designed myself for a project. Which is a Laura to Wi-Fi gateway. Right, this, I designed this a while ago and I redesigned it last year, late last year, because it's for this year. And so it's just an ESP32 with some lower module connections on it, a built-in DC to DC converter and a header there for the display. And it's just a really self-contained board. So I'm going to repurpose this board and use this for my project, or in this case for the touch deck. So I've already got a display here and these have the pin headers on the side, this style. Oh, those pins are bent, I have to straighten it up. It's the 3.5 inch TFT SPI 480x320 display version 1. Once those pins are straight, it will just basically pop through the end here. So that's the back of the ball and it will basically go through there. Right, but what I'll do is I don't like to do direct solder connections to things which may need replacing in the future. I like to make things plug and play. So in this case, I have a piece of female header here, which I'm going to chuck in there. I'll solder that in place like that, and then this will then plug into this header. I also have spaces. I need to put some standoffs on these corners of the balls. This is what it's designed to do. So I've got standoffs I have to put in there to stand this off the ball so it's been mounted on there. Not a big deal. Easy to do. So I've made a few of these already. And the SP32 will just go in here. Now, as far as powering it goes, I've got some choices. What I'd like to do is actually make this battery powered. So there's no cables, because the free touch tech uses Bluetooth to communicate with the computer, so that's like a virtual keyboard. So all it's really doing is when you push the buttons on the screen, is you're using a virtual keyboard, sending commands to your computer to do certain functions. That's what it does. Now I actually built something along the same line some time ago. Let's grab it, I'm sitting on my shelf here. Not currently plugged in. This is just an Arduino. Oh, the plug's falling out now, I don't know which pin it goes to. Little Arduino Micro, Pro Micro is it? Anyway, it's got a motion sensor on it. This is an automatic switcher. So I designed this, so this just sits on my shelf. And when I come over to my desk here to do a live stream, it triggered the Arduino, which then sent key press commands to my computer and changed the scene on my computer to automatically switch over to my desk. Now that was fine when I had it plugged in, but sometimes because I had it fixed to a certain key combination. So if I was trying to do a zoomed in view of the camera, it would suddenly switch to a wide view things like that so it wasn't as ideal as I wanted I could have obviously revised it and I was actually going to do some changes and actually have input so I could set it which screen version to go to but I'm going to build this touch deck thing instead because why not I've got the bits so as I was saying in regards to pairing this thing in theory you should better use a USB cable plug straight into an USB 32 it's already got a socket built in there for the USB USB micro plug the USB cable in and it would power this that board and hence the screen the thing is the ESP32s, when they use Wi-Fi, because you do use Wi-Fi on this particular project as well to program the thing and set it all up for the key combinations you want, it can use like up to an amp, so you might find you've got a bit of power starvation going on. Potentially. It's unlikely, but it may or may not be an issue with just using the USB. It depends on your system, I suppose. But that's one option, and that's probably going to be my backup solution. And as I already have a footprint on here for a... DC power supply, all right, for that DC to DC step down converter. I normally run these things off like 24 volts and going in, and then it drops it down to 5. Give you some idea. But what I was thinking is using battery power, and I can actually use a 18650 or maybe a pair of 18650s, either in a singly or in series. Depending on which way I do this, I could use a single battery and then step it up, or use two batteries and step it down. I'm undecided yet. What I'm going to do is basically build it, see what the current draw is like, and then try and make a decision from that and to see how things work out. The only step up converters I've got, I've got a big one which is like 3 amps which is a bit ridiculous. I've also got one which is 1 amp which is a different footprint. That's probably pushing it a little bit for current wise if the Wi-Fi is running this. But then it's not going to be generally running Wi-Fi, it's only when you're programming it. So I'm not really too worried about that part. So I've got a few things to, to decide on yet. If I do battery power it then I need to put in things like a charging circuit and things like that. So I've got a few things to actually consider. But at the moment I'm just going to build it as a basic 5 volt system running off the power jack on the USB32. And we'll go from there. 
Right, let's get this thing started off, solder this header on. So what I'm going to do now is do the same thing for the ESP32. Now, the ESP32 is generally, you can you can actually solder into the board and just program them just fine through USB and not having issues. But, depending on which pins you've used and what kind of devices you're interfacing to, you can have a problem. Like in my case, in this ESP32 here, if I have the LoRa module plugged in, I can't program it. Because the connections on these pins affect the ones that it uses when it's booting up and stuff like that. So actually it has an effect because it's shared pins. They do certain functions when it's booting and things like that. In my case I have to be careful about what I do. In this instance it doesn't matter. I could actually solder the ball straight on. But I still don't like to do that. I still like to put the thing on headers. So that's what I'm going to do. That one is. There we go. So that'll drop in. Now I'm still doing another one. The same length. And then we'll get those lined up. Solder them in. So the thing with these headers, you can't actually stick them end to end and just use them because if you've got offcuts, you can't just do that because the the um, the wall thickness on the ends here means you can't do it. The spacing goes out of whack. Even if you do trim right down to the right size, you just can't do it. It doesn't work. So I'll just clean these up anyway just to make them a bit nicer. And then solder those in. Now the easiest way to get this right is actually to plug the things into the ESP32. So if I plug this in, both sets of pins, I say as I don't actually plug into the L set of pins. Like that. Then we push them into the board and it's in. So that's the way around it goes and that sort of stuff. So I've just got to solder that in like that and that's all definitely going to line up. Nice and easy. Only problem is it wants to fall over all the time because that's just the way it falls. Alright, let's put this thing in. Now you may notice that I do things like linger on the pins quite a lot. I'll do that to get the flow right through the ball. Oh, come off my little wrist there. Make sure it's pushed right down. Right, let's make sure it's definitely seated right down. So I'm just trying to get the solder to flow through the ball. Once I get each end down, it's a bit easier. Depends on what I'm working on. Some bits of gear you can't actually the older stuff especially, you can't put lingo on with a lot of heat for too long because it does actually result in the traces lifting off the board. And it can be a problem for trying to disolder things. But these modern PCBs, which are brand new like this, they can withstand quite a bit of heat because they're actually usually meant for lead-free solder, which requires more heat as well. So the actual adhesive which holds the copper onto the substrate is a bit tougher. So my iron is at 350 degrees C. And that does tend to result in flux burning a little bit, which does make it harder to clean, but it means that you get uh, better flowing of the, th the solder for a shorter time. If I was using a lower temperature, it would take a lot more effort to get it through the ball and that sort of thing. So it's a bit of a trade off. Sometimes I even solder hotter than that. Generally, I'll say use the lowest heat you can get away with, but this is just the one I'm used to using. I adjust my technique to suit what I'm doing rather than adjusting the temperature. Now there is one modification I probably need to do to this board as well. The backlighting on it is run directly off the 3.3 volt rail. And that can be controlled by the software on the free touch deck. So I may or may not change that. It's easy to get to. Again, this is an advantage of having things plug in. Because if you need to do any changes to the board, you can just unplug things, make the changes you need to do, and plug it back in again. So it's a bit easier in that way. Right, let's clean this up. We don't really need to record this, but you know, why not? We have a scrub to get rid of the worst of the flux, and then we'll stick this on and try and get it to soak up into the tissue. Alright, how's that go? Not too bad, there's still some residue there. Like I said, because I use such a hot iron, it means it's quite hard for the flux to actually um, survive it. It does tend to burn the flux a little bit. So I have to do a bit of scrubbing because I do use a lot of heat. It's a trade-off, you know. I know that I'm burning it a little bit. It's just the way I work. 
I mean, technically, I probably don't really need to clean the flux off, I just like to do it. That will do. So, that's almost there anyway. There's not much left to do, really, because, I mean, really, what we've got to do is you get the screen, you plug the screen in, like so. Got to put standoffs in there, that's not a big deal. Then you've got to power it and program it. It's a pretty easy project. So, one of the things I've got in my collection of bits and pieces is these little standoff spacers. Now, I need to get the spacing right. So that's the tricky bit, is getting one which is exactly the right height. Now I've got some, was it 8mm? I think it was the one I was the closest one before, was it? I think it's something else. No, it's not that one. 10mm. 10 10mm 10 is close, but not quite. I've got 12 Now 12mm is actually a little bit on the big side, but it may not actually matter. It just means this is going to be stood out of here very slightly. It won't be fully seated down. So a 12mm I could probably do, and it'll be okay. So what I used previously, because I was worried about space, is I actually used a 10mm with a washer, just to get it so it was actually fully beaded down, because I was in a really tight spot. Alright, so that's all those on there, it's got to tighten these up. So this is a little screwdriver set which I picked up a while ago, really handy to have it when little hexagonal screwdrivers, nut drivers. Really good for doing standoff stuff like this, because it just fits beautifully, it makes it really easy to do, so struggling around with a pair of pliers or whatever, just makes it much nicer. So these standoffs are 5mm standoffs. That's just enough clearance for the screen, so the screen won't touch. There's actually a bit of a standoff here, so this is slightly proud of the screen. And that's important because when you mount this into an enclosure, you don't want anything resting against the front of the screen, because if you do that, it could cause it to sense touches incorrectly. It's just purely sensing where there's a contact on the screen, and if there's something touching there slightly or even intermittently, because of flexing in the enclosure, then you have problems with touch. So make sure that those are proud, it's not actually resting against the screen. The screen cannot be touching anything. The other thing I need to do is obviously figure out how I'm going to power this thing. I've got to make a decision about that. I've got positions here for bulk capacitors. Now most of these aren't really needed now because it's not using a lot of power. Because I said I did have two lower modules on this thing before, one watt lower modules, and so it needed you know quite hefty power requirements. Although it's very intermittent surges and stuff like that. So I don't really need a lot of these bulk capacitors on here anymore. But I'm still going to put something on this five volt supply. So I've got a space here for five volt cap. I'm going to put that one there. That will help bolster the 5 volt supply rail, which should help bolster everything. That's the only one I really need. These ones are just local bulk capacitors for the lower modules. And this is a 3.3 volt rail one to help bolster the backlight of this thing. And the actual um, ESP32 itself, because that's in parallel with this, was actually part of that supply rail. So that's actually helping to reinforce the regulator on this board. Probably doesn't really need it, so I'm just going to put the big 5 volt one in here and leave it at that. So when I originally designed this, I designed it for a massive capacitor there to give it heaps of storage capacity. What I'm going to do is use up some of my old crappy capacitors which I've had for a while. This is a 470 microfarad AC brand. 105 degree rated though, so it shouldn't be too bad. But I've had it for a while. 16 volt, 470 microfarad. And that should be enough just to help reinforce the supply. Close enough. It's not actually the right footprint for this thing. It's actually got a narrow footprint on the cap than it has on the actual holes. That's why it's also not helping. Anyway, that'll do. It just helps to reinforce the supply slightly. Probably doesn't really need it, it's not doing a lot. I need to look at the software side of things now and actually get that done. Get it programmed, then we can power it up and see what actually happens. Um, it could be interesting. When we do power it for the first time, it will actually need to calibrate the screen and stuff like that. But that's not a big deal. That's easy. So I'm just looking at the code now. I've downloaded the various libraries and stuff like that. I haven't tried compiling or anything yet. Now, I notice there's a IRQ pin which is configured in the libraries, which is on display here. Now in my case I never used the IRQ so I didn't actually have a connection for it. Now the default pin as in the library from Dustin Watts is pin 27 which is over here which is fine I'll just run that wire I'll just wire it onto there over to here to pin 27 and we'll get that done. So at least stick with the defaults as per his library I don't want to deviate from that in case I do updates in the future. Now one other thing I've got here is a little one microfarad capacitor I'm going to install this on the ESP32. There's a reason for this. Anyone that's done work with the Dev Kit V1 will know that sometimes when you program it, you have to hold a button down in order to get the thing to program, right? You have to hold it down so the IDE can actually communicate with it. A bit of a pain. If you stick this capacitor between the enable pin and ground, it will stop that problem from happening. The problem goes away. It's just purely a timing thing. It has to hold the pin down low enough and that sort of stuff. And that it's Anyway, it works. So if you stick this on the enable pin, that will solve that problem. You don't have to push the button down anymore. Saves a lot of messing around. I just like to do it on all the boards. Whenever I install a board like this, I uh, I put a capacitor on it. Solves that problem completely. So let's install this capacitor now. And I see pins have already sleeved the actual legs on the capacitor. 
put them in position so it's a bit easier to install. I haven't actually tinned them yet though, I should probably do that. Set that on there. Just got to bend the other leg round. Get it all straight. This capacitor leg is just the right length to reach this pin. It's, just, it's always really convenient. Don't have to cut this leg, I only got to cut one of them. Alright, so that's a capacitor wire then. So that means now I don't have to mess around pushing buttons any time I want to program it. Just makes it a little bit easier. So I finally finished building this thing. I've added that jumper wire one from the IRQ line over to here. Done the software changes and from the original files supplied by Dustin Watts um, just to suit my board here. And it does actually work. Now the problem I've got is that my computer doesn't work with it. So I've had to purchase a um, a Bluetooth upgrade for that. I'm waiting for that to arrive. But I know it does work because I've worked with this on my wife's computer. Hooked up to wife's computer. Well, did the Bluetooth through that one, which is a newer computer. And it could work. So that was fine. So let's plug this thing in. Now one thing I did is I rotated the screen as well. So I like to have the cable coming out from the right hand side. Because that will just suit my setup. Normally by default, at least on my board here, it will sit that way around instead. Which is upside down. You can do a set rotation on the screen in the setup section of the IDE. And then you can tell it which way around you want your screen. Um, I think this is set rotation 3 is this way around. So you've got the header on the left hand side. And as you can see I've got some basic setups on here, put some rough icons in here. So basically what you do is you go to the Wi-Fi side of it and you turn the Wi-Fi on and it will connect to your Wi-Fi network and then you can connect directly to this thing, it tells you the IP address and then you can connect to it from a computer and modify the settings and upload icons for the logos and stuff like that. Now obviously because I've turned the Wi-Fi on it's now stuck in this mode. I'm just going to do a reset and bring it back up again. So it's nice and easy to use. I mean, these are just my icons. I just those are the ones I shoved in. You can get much nicer ones. They're still in the way, the original ones, but this is just what I configured for mine. I'm not a graphic artist by any means. Anyway, it's working. Excellent work, Dustin Watts, and all the other people which contributed to the project. It wasn't just Dustin. Dustin did the final project, but his had contributions from I think uh, Brian Locke as well, and a few others who helped to contribute in various ways with libraries and things like that. And that's all credited in his GitHub information. Thank you much, everyone, for making one of these. So once I get my Bluetooth upgraded to my computer, I better do live streams, and I better set this up for my live streams and use this. Now, there are some other things that I need to do for software, and that is that uh, this will just send out keystrokes. That's basically what it does, all right? As it acts as a BLE keyboard. If the software that you're using for the keystrokes isn't at the very front, at least in my case on a Mac, then it may not actually trigger the thing you want. So what I've actually done, my project I did with a movement sensor, I think I showed at the beginning, that sent out a search command to first search for the program, find it, and then when it does that it'll make it the frontmost application, and then it sends the keystrokes to control the application. That's how I did it. It's a bit of a clunky way, but it worked. Now I might need to modify this to do the same thing. Um, I don't have that done yet. Once I get the Bluetooth keyboard set up on there, then I'll do that and start playing around that side of it. So it's not quite finished in that regard. And I think there are other ways of doing mapping as well for keystrokes. I probably can map the keystrokes a different way. Make sure to get routed to the application. There probably are ways of doing it. I haven't researched it properly yet, but excellent little project. Really convenient, really simple to do. And I recommend you have a look at it yourself. And subscribe, click the bell icon, give us a thumbs up, and I'll catch you later. Don't forget to subscribe, click like. See, I'll see you right here. Bye.